Why are space discoveries important? Well, the, the significance is it's our understanding of the universe and therefore our understanding of our place in the universe. So when we look out to space, we're looking into the past. And the better our telescopes means the further back into the, the universe that we can look and the more we can learn. You know, 95% of the universe, we still don't really understand. We call it dark matter and dark energy. So things like the James Webb Space Telescope can really unlock the secrets of the universe and they can literally expand our horizons. We can see further back into space and we can learn more about where we came from. What space missions are you looking forward to? And we're going back to the moon and that's what's really exciting in September hopefully we'll see the first uncrewed Artemis mission and that'll be followed next year by the first crewed Artemis mission going back to the moon after 50 years. Can you give an example of why we go to space? Up in weightlessness is why we can do all this brilliant science and we can learn a lot more about uh, our own bodies or about our own health and how we can look after uh, people as they get older because effectively when we go into space our bodies go through a rapid aging process so we can learn a lot more about how we age and therefore help our aging population. Are astronauts trained to make contact with aliens? I remember the first time coming back from space and one of the children just said was there a, a lesson on how to deal with first contact? And I just thought that was brilliant. And you know, the, the answer is there's not, but I just imagined, you know, being in a NASA classroom with my fellow astronauts, having a lesson on how to deal with first contact. Perhaps we should. I think actually here at the, you know, the Jodrell Bank, the radio telescope, if we ever do make contact, I think it's going to be through something like this. It's going to be a signal arriving at the speed of light, a radio wave that can show us a sign of digital intelligence. Intelligence. So I think it's likely to happen by receiving a signal more than any uh, sort of extraterrestrial knocking on the door of the space station. Can humans send messages into space? Yes, we have sent messages, the Arecibo signal back in the 1970s uh, with information about who we are. Um, and we have to think very carefully about that, discussing about, you know, uh, thinking about how we would make first contact and how we would uh, establish peaceful and friendly contact, but not giving too much of ourselves away in, in terms of our DNA and our, our makeup and things that could be used against us. Um, but yes, we do have to think, think carefully. But of course, you know, so many scientists around the world are trying to look out into the universe and answer that question of, of are we alone? The planets in our solar system are named after Roman gods and goddesses. Originally, we only knew about six planets, that's Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. But as time went on, we started using telescopes to look at space, and we discovered a few more planets. These we called Uranus and Neptune, keeping on with that Roman theme. Since 1992, we've actually been discovering planets outside of our own solar system. These are called extrasolar planets, or exoplanets for short. And to date, we found over 4,000 of them. These are named a little bit differently to how the old ones are named. The first part of the name is actually the name of the star that the planet goes around. For example, the first planet that we discovered was going around a star called 51 Pegasi. The second part of that name is actually an alphabetical label for the planet itself. For example, going back to this one from before, we call that planet 51 Pegasi B. If we happen to find a system with more than one planet in it, then we just continue with the alphabet. For example, we know of one system which has seven planets in it, it's called the TRAPPIST-1 system, and the planet furthest out from its star is called TRAPPIST-1H. The simple answer to this question is that our rocket wouldn't last very long at all. But let's assume that the star we're flying our rocket into is the Sun. The first problem we're going to run into is temperature. Unfortunately for our rocket, the Sun is very hot. The surface of the Sun is about 6 thousand degrees Celsius, whereas your oven at home might only be able to get as hot as 200 degrees Celsius. In 2018, NASA launched a probe called the Parker Solar Probe, which is flying around the sun right now, 
sending us back information about the sun. The heat shields on the Parker solar probe keep the instruments inside from melting. And they can protect those instruments up to temperatures of 1,370 degrees Celsius. But even with such great heat shields, the Parker solar probe can get no closer than 6 million kilometers from the sun. Any closer and it would melt. But let's assume our rocket is made of magic, unmeltable material. We'd run into more problems. The sun is also giving out streams of really energetic charged particles that would start to interfere with the electronics on board and would break all our computer systems. Even if we had unmeltable material and our computer systems were fail safe and we went plunging into the sun, things still wouldn't look very good. As we fell through all the hot gas that the sun is made of, the pressure would build up and up and up until eventually our rocket would be crushed. So whatever the circumstances, flying a rocket into a star is not advisable. So the sun is a star, which is a big ball of hot gas in our skies. But there are millions and billions of other stars as well. Different temperature stars look different colors. Stars that are much cooler than our sun, such as Betelgeuse in the constellation of Orion, tend to look a lot more red. And stars that are much hotter than our sun, such as the star Rigel, look to be more blue. Our sun is somewhere in the middle. If we were to fly on a spaceship away from the Earth and look at the sun from space, the sun would actually look to be white. But this isn't because the sun is white. The sun is giving off all different types of colours, red, orange, yellow, and even green and blue. And all of these colours add together to create what we call white light. So the sun looks to be white. But here on the Earth's surface, when we look at the sun, the sunlight has to pass through all of space to get here. And as it does this, it passes through something called the Earth's atmosphere, which is a big layer of gas that surrounds the whole Earth. As the sunlight passes through the atmosphere, the atmosphere acts as a filter, and some of those colours get filtered out. So the greens and the blues get filtered away, and we're left with the more yellowy colours. You might have noticed that if you look at the sun, at sunrise or sunset, the sun looks to be a lot more red. This is because when the sun is at the horizon in these positions as it's setting and rising, the sunlight has to pass through much more of this atmosphere, so even more of those colours are filtered out, so we're just left behind with the red colours. The Earth was made out of the leftovers from the formation of the Sun. So around just over four and a half billion years ago, the solar system was a big cloud of dust and gas. And then gravity tends to pull things together. And so ultimately, if you have a big cloud of stuff, then it can pretty easily collapse. And it collapses, the star forms first at the center, and all the other little bits of dust that are left going around the star can collapse as well to form the planets and the moons and uh, all the comets and asteroids that we find in our solar system. Well, Aisha, uh, the Earth is um, about four and a half billion years old. And the reason we know that, there are, there are different ways of finding out how old things are. And one of them is to look at rocks and to look at um, atoms in the rocks called radioactive atoms, which decay. So they fall to bits and uh, they're, they're like little clocks. And so let's say you have a, let's say you have a hundred atoms of something and in, in one billion years, half of those would have fallen to bits and gone away. Then you can use that as a clock. You can see how many of those atoms are present in the rock and that allows you to date it. So that's one way. And then you can also look at the way that the, the Earth, the surface of the Earth changes and moves. There's a thing called plate tectonics, which is that the, the parts of the Earth shift against other parts and split away. So for example, the Atlantic Ocean, if you look at a map of the Earth, um, then you might see that if you look at America and South America and Africa and Europe, they look like they fit together. And that's because they did fit together once. And the Atlantic Ocean has been spreading apart by quite just a few centimetres per year 
but that allows you to estimate how long it was, for example, since the Atlantic Ocean began to form. And so there are different ways of doing it. The most accurate way, though, is with the rocks. Why does the Earth spin? Why does the Earth turn, Gracie? That's a good question. The, the, there's a general rule in physics, and it is a, it's, a, it's a law of nature, that if things are spinning, then they carry on spinning. It doesn't stop. And so if you imagine this big cloud of gas and dust that was collapsing to form the solar system, then unless you, it was very, very unusual, which it wouldn't be, and it all collapsed exactly the same way, things tend to spin. And then, so once something's spinning, then that spin is there forever. Um, and so what we think is that the, the, the spin of all the planets and the orbits of the planets, they all go around in the same direction. And the reason for that is that you're seeing the spin of the initial cloud of dust that collapsed to form the sun.